Amen. Amen. Well, I also want to welcome you this morning on Easter Sunday. And can I say, you look very, very sharp this morning. You look very good. In fact, look at your neighbor. Tell him you look good this morning. You look good this morning. Yeah. Rob, you look good this morning. Now, my last church I was a part of, it was a bit of an older congregation. In fact, there was a good majority of the people that had been attending that church longer than I had been breathing. And it was always amazing that there was a correlation between how the Holy Spirit moved and how effective I was as a preacher. It was correlated to whether I was wearing a suit or not. And anytime I'd put a suit, I'd have them come up and they'd go, son, God spoke today. You look sharp like a preacher. And uh, so I thought I'd put on the suit today. Maybe to help out a little bit. But we are all dressed up for Easter Sunday. The day that the stone was rolled away. The day that the tomb was empty. The day that Mary went down, hanging her head low to see Jesus. And she met an angel and said, and he said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Christ has risen. And then I picture her running back as fast as he can to tell the disciples. And then I see Peter going, what? Running as fast as he can with his sandals falling off, tripping over rocks to get to the tomb to see that it has been empty. Wondering what has happened. Easter Sunday. As we would come to learn, as they would come to learn, it is the most incredible event in human history. Not the birth of Christ, as important as it was, he could have been born and chose not to die. Not the death of Christ, as important as it was, he could have died and not rose again. But it is in that moment when he rose again from the dead and defeated the grave that we could find hope, purpose, and peace beyond anything that we could imagine. That we come to find out God's extent, the extent of his love for every one of us. That we learn what forgiveness meant. Without it, I'd have no reason to get dressed up and stand here and preach to you. We'd have no reason to have our kids come up and be so cute while they're singing. We'd have no reason for the worship team to lead us in singing and praising the Lord. We'd have no reason to pray for Brian and Lynn to send them off because we would have no hope. That is why we celebrate, because we have hope. For three simple words, he is risen. He is risen. So important that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching would be futile, and our faith would be empty. I'm glad I don't have an empty faith. How about you, church? All the people that put in all the effort this week from, the, from getting the stage set up here to our worship team, to the choir, to the parking lot, to the first impressions, everybody, all came together because they want to share that hope they have with you this morning. And that is what we've been praying for this week. That today that we could introduce you to Jesus again and maybe for the first time. Now with this said, with all this joy and all this excitement, celebrating the resurrection of Christ, it seems like the amount of people that believe in this incredible event seems to be getting smaller. You see it in the acts of our government. You see it in the entertainment that we choose. You see it in our schooling. You see it in our professions. You see it most in how we live our daily lives. What we set as our priorities. In fact, a recent study was done and it was asking people what makes up their identity. And their faith was number three. Behind their family and behind being an American. Now, being a patriot and loving my country is important. Loving my family is extremely important. But they fail in comparison to finding my identity in the creator of the heaven and the earth, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, God. Finding my identity 
in salvation through Jesus Christ. Everything else can fail me. My family can fail and fall apart. My jobs can fall apart. My country can fall apart. But as we will talk about today, God is always there. He is always steady. His promises are ever sure, and they're the only thing that I can trust in. And when I do trust in them, it holds everything else together. And yet, our own younger generations, which I'm still slightly a part of, slightly, <laughs> oh. <laughs> our younger generations, they see Christ less important than any of the other generations alive today. It's a trend that is going in the wrong direction. Because our younger generations will make up the leadership of tomorrow and will influence the next generations. To me, sometimes it feels like we're giving up on Jesus. Now notice I didn't say giving up on God. Most everybody believes in some kind of higher power. I didn't say giving up on faith because we all live by faith. It's just a dependence on what we put our faith in. I, I did not say spirituality. More than ever, people consider themselves spiritual. I said, I feel like we're giving up on Jesus. And the, way I, the reason I focus on Jesus, because it is Jesus and Jesus alone that separates Christianity from every other way that we could believe, from every other faith out there, Jesus stands uniquely different. Not just in this country, but from the entire world. And because I believe this, because I believe that Jesus died for our sins and that he rose again, that it is in him that we can find salvation and restored relationship with God, that I am compelled, compelled this morning to tell you not to give up on Jesus. I am compelled this morning to preach Jesus to those of you who are struggling and doubting with who Jesus is in your life. I am compelled to preach and encourage those of you who have walked away from Jesus to walk on back. I am compelled to those of you who are reaching out to those who are struggling to be patient and not let them give up on Jesus because there is no other name in which we can find salvation but the name of Jesus. So I ask you this morning to give me your ear for this next little bit. Give me your eyes. Wherever you are in your walk with God, to ask him, God, show me who you are today. Help me find you. And it's my prayer that at the end of this, at the end of your walk, that you will encompass that one word in Jesus that you will believe and be changed. In a few minutes, we're going to turn to John 20. If you want to get ahead of time, uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of us, page 1226. If you're using the Net Bibles, you can, our ushers will probably bring some by if you can kind of flag them down. You know, when I was a little kid, I had one of those story Bibles that had pictures in them. And I would read stories of God doing all these miracles. And so what I would do and you tell me if you've done this, if you even as kids, I would take my teddy bear at night and I would lay him sideways. And I would say, God, by the time I wake up in the morning, I want you to sit him straight up. Anybody ever done that with God? Are you serious? No one's ever done that? Okay, okay thank you, Donna. I appreciate the honesty. Okay, we've done that. We're like, okay, set him up by morning. And obviously the, fir the first day I would wake up and it wouldn't happen, so the second night I would do it, and then the third night I would do it, and I'd be like, God, what's the deal? If you could part, you know, I'm a kid, you can part the Red Seas. I've given you eight hours to move a teddy bear. What is the deal? And obviously, it would never happen. You know, or do you remember as a kid, I know people have done this, where you'd go to a light when your parents were driving, and it'd be red, and you'd like, God, turn it green. Green. Anybody ever done that? You guys live in New Jersey. You probably still do that to this day. <laughs> Green. And then, you know, every once in a while you get lucky and you're like, God, God, he, he changed it. Now, my dad, who I grew up with some time, he was kind of a no-nonsense, you know, kind of guy. He'd just say, you got lucky, son. And, you know, crush my hopes. But th this is the illustration of, you know, me as a kid. 
But I feel like that our faith can be like that in Jesus, even as adults. And because God does not come through in the way that we expect him to, it causes us to doubt and ultimately give up on Jesus. And they did a study, Barna did a study recently and talked about the reasons that people doubt Jesus. And there was three main ones that came up. And I'm sure that there are many reasons that people doubt, but I want to focus on three this morning. And the first one is because we do not need Jesus. More than ever, people don't feel like they need Jesus. You know, we live in a culture now that is obsessed with political correctness. You have to be so careful about what you say about anything. We're in a society that just embraces relativism, that truth is all a matter of perspective. All truth is good truth, and all beliefs are great beliefs, and all roads lead to the same place. Now, don't get me wrong. All views should be respected and explored. But the key word there is explored. You just see, there's, there doesn't seem to be a strong desire to seek out truth anymore. Maybe it's because of technology and it's so easy to just find like-minded people to hang out with. We're not forced to do it. I don't know. But in the time of Jesus, this would have driven people nuts. The rabbis, the teachers of that day, if they couldn't find with someone to argue with them, they would get mad. And it says they would scream sometimes, won't anybody argue with me? Otherwise, how else are we going to learn? Nowadays, if we argue with somebody, they get mad. They get offended. How dare you disagree with my point of view? How could I possibly be wrong? We've kind of like ostriches. We just stick our hand in the sand, look at what we want to look at, see what we want to see. And it begs the question this morning, do you seek out truth in your life? Are you satisfied with just what you believe and you're good? Whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, do you study to show yourself approved? If, if you believe in a follower of Jesus, do you really know? Can you really defend it? Can you really have an answer as Peter compels us to do? If you don't believe, is it just because it's convenient for you? Or have you actually did, been the diligence to figure out what is the most important decision you could have in your entire life? You guys remember the blue and the white dress that came out about a month ago on the web all over everywhere? I asked this a few weeks ago, but it's relevant today. How many were the blue and the, the blue and the black? Yeah, okay, the wise ones, all right, good. And the white, the white and gold? Yeah, yeah, and now listen, when it comes to the idea of relativism, it would be the idea of saying, look, it doesn't matter. You say it's white and gold, so it's white and gold. I believe it's blue and black, so it's blue and black. That's what it is. That's how we're starting to look at our lives and our culture. But no, the dress is clearly blue and black. The evidence came out. In fact, I think one science guy looked at it and said, people who saw blue and black are actually smarter individuals and have better eyesight. <laughs> I didn't verify it, but since I saw blue and black, it sounded pretty good. <laughs> but no matter what we say, it's blue and it's black. Me saying it's white and gold doesn't change anything. It is the same when it comes to our faith. Now, another reason that I think we give up on Jesus is because we don't believe in Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about that Jesus existed. 92% of our country believes he existed. But it's that we don't believe Jesus was actually the Son of God, that he died and then he rose again. Third reason is because people just don't want Jesus anymore. You know what? This is a special Sunday. It's Easter. We should do something fun and unique. I'll tell you what. I have placed inside an envelope a $10 gift card to the Kmart Shea, to Kmart. So go ahead and check under your seats for me. Somewhere out there, check under. I'm serious. I really put one under your seats. Check. Just check. Let me know if you see it. Let me know if you see it. Anybody? Getting concerned. Anyone? Maybe somebody over in this, hey, hey, I see somebody. I see someone, there we go. Hey, I hope I can come down here. This is my, now this is my apologies. I had to extra secure it because it kept falling down. And I have some staff members that were eyeing it. Do you mind if I ask you your name? Kendall. Kendall, I'm Jeff. Nice to meet you. Now what do you think's in here? 
I had no clue. I actually wasn't going to check it, check at all. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, maybe we should check. I said that there was a $10 gift card for Kmart in there. Why don't we open it up? It won't explode, I promise. I'm right here. There you go. Yeah, there we go. All right. All right. Ah, it's a $50 gift card to Amazon. Excellent. Yes. Yes. That's what happens when Rob leaves his credit card out on his desk. Now, let me tell you, are you, are you more excited or less excited to get a $50 gift card to Amazon than a $10 gift card to Kmart? Um, more excited. More excited. <laughs> Hopefully no one from Kmart works here, okay? All right, okay, thank you, Kendall. I appreciate it. Keep the guard. It's actually active. It works for you. You can buy me something nice. <laughs> See, no matter how bad I preach, he's going to like me now. <laughs> now, the point of this is sometimes when we come to church, we have an expectation that we're going to get something. I told him a $10 gift card to Kmart. Sometimes when people come to church, like Noel had preached this when he was here in January, they expect that Jesus is going to make them healthy, wealthy, and wise. They call it the prosperity gospel. And then when it doesn't happen, they get mad and they leave because it's not what they expected. Some of us think that when we become a Christian that everything's going to start going our way. Peace and serenity. Ah. And when it doesn't go that way because of those expectations, they can begin to doubt Jesus and walk away. Some of you find Jesus, you come to a church and you learn a very cruel truth. That not everybody in church is actually nice. I know it's shocking. That there's actually some of us, me included, are messed up people in church. But you have this idea that, well, that, you know, Jesus is so loving that all of his followers should be loving. Which is true, but we're all in process, right? Some maybe far longer than others. And so you get angry. And it <clears throat> didn't meet your expectation. So I'm done with the church. I'll still believe in Jesus. But in the end, <clears throat> you end up alone. And your faith begins to dissipate because God never meant for faith in him to be something that was done alone but with others. It begs that question that what expectations do you have of Jesus? And where did they come from? You see, these are three reasons that we give up on Jesus, but in the end, they all melt down to one. They start with one place. They are things that start us to doubt Christ. Doubt. We doubt on Jesus, we doubt Jesus, and then we end up giving up on Jesus for one reason for another. Now, we always look at doubt as a negative, but I also want you to show you that doubt can be a positive. That doubt does not necessarily lead you away from Jesus or to the end of your faith, but it can lead you to Jesus. That it is the beginning of faith. Now, in the Bible, who's most famous for being a doubter? Doubting? Very good. Doubting Thomas. Now, as we turn to John chapter 20, let me give you some background here. You see, the disciples, we're going to talk about Thomas today, were meeting together in a secret room, and they were locked away. Jesus had just died. They were afraid what was going to happen to them. They're meeting together, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, with a locked door, Jesus just appears and blows them away. It tends to happen when you appear in a room that has a locked door. I haven't personally done it, but I imagine it's awesome. Maybe there's a noise that happens when he does it, like a swoosh, I don't know. But he just appears. And I got to imagine the disciples are just blown away. And he shows them their wounds and, and they all rejoice because it's true. Now the only problem is that Thomas was not there. Let's turn to verse 24. Now Thomas called Didymus. If you guys are looking for a new name for your boy and you're pregnant, Didymus, there you go. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. And the other type of disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the wounds from the nails in the hands and put my finger into those wounds from the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe it. So what's the first thing we notice here? Verse 24, Thomas wasn't in church. You look at all the disciples together, it's clear Thomas was not in church. Thomas missed church. 
The power of Jesus he missed. The proof of Jesus he missed. The peace be with you he missed. You miss stuff when you're not in church. You miss stuff. And he wasn't there to experience it. Now seriously, I think we all know that this is the time that we would normally throw Thomas under the bus of doubt. We'd throw him under it. We'd roll over him. We'd back up. And we would roll over him again. Maybe a couple more times. Thomas always gets such a bad rap. Even though he was not the only disciple who did not believe. And it's not like he wasn't committed. Earlier in John chapter 11, Jesus was going to see Lazarus because Lazarus just died. He was going to raise him from the dead. And Thomas said in there, Let's go along with Jesus and we'll die with him. You know, because of the threats that were coming on Jesus. Now that may be a touch pessimistic. Hey, let's go with Jesus and maybe die too. But he was committed. Not many people that I would offer to go with if there was a chance of death. I think Thomas didn't simply, he just didn't understand what was going to happen. Later in John chapter 14, verse 5, as, as Jesus was trying to prepare them, say, here's what's coming down the road. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Thomas later says, I don't quite understand. Go where? How can I come? You see, they didn't all fully grasp Christ at this time. So now we give him a little credit. He was a follower. He's committed. Let's jump to verse 26 here. It says, eight days later, the disciples were again together in the house. And this time, Thomas was with them. This time, Thomas was in church. And Jesus is going to show up. And think of his mindset these eight days later. He followed Jesus all of these days. He saw Jesus bring Lazarus back. But this was unheard of that Jesus, he watched probably. Jesus died, put into the grave, his dead body wrapped. Can't blame him, I think we would all question. But even though he, he didn't believe, he didn't give up on Jesus. He was with the disciples. I mean, he could have just checked out, said, you guys are on your own. I'm out of here, my life's on the line. He stayed with them. You know, I... And this doubt that he had, even though he said, I had to touch the wounds, he stayed with them. It was going to lead him somewhere. It was going to lead him to find Jesus, as we'll see in a few moments. Now, when you define doubt, it's, it's a, considered a lack of certainty, a lack of conviction in something, a lack of conviction. And anytime you doubt anything, anytime you have a lack of conviction in something, you got one of two choices. Either you're going to give up, you're going to walk away from it, say, nah, this isn't for me, or you're going to investigate it and figure out if your doubts are true or if you're wrong. And we'll see what happens as Thomas sticks around to investigate what happens. Back to verse 26. He says, although, and it says, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, once again, whoosh, into the locked room, peace be with you. I can only imagine what that was like as they're sitting around in fear again. Now some of the disciples are more excited and encouraged. They've seen Jesus. And look what happens. It says, he goes right to Thomas and he said to Thomas, put your finger in here. Examine my hands. Extend your hand and put it into my side. And he says, do not continue in your unbelief, but believe. And Thomas replied to him, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. But blessed are those people who have not seen and yet to believe. Notice this. This is, this is key. It's easy to read over. He goes straight to Thomas. He goes straight to the one who wants to believe. He's not like a faith preacher that goes to Thomas. You do not have enough faith, so you do not get to see you cannot be healed. Pull out his hanky. You cannot be healed. You don't have enough faith. I'm sure you've seen him on TV. Got to have faith. And afterwards, I'll sell you this hanky that's been prayed over with holy oil and sell it to you. It'll make your prayers come. 
no. He goes straight, straight to Thomas. Touch my hands. Touch my side. This is very key right here. I want you to hear this. Jesus gave Thomas exactly what he needed to believe. He gave Thomas what he needed to believe. You see, sometimes we look at Christianity as this blind faith that we're just walking off the end of the pier hoping there's a boat at the end. But that is not the kind of faith that we are called, called to. There is evidence for what we believe. I wish we had time to go through it. That's why Peter says, always be ready to give an answer. Know what you believe, why you believe, because it is worth believing in. And you can't say, well, you know, that's great, there's evidence and stuff, but I'm just not a person of faith. We're all people of faith, every one of us. We're all filled with faith. And that doubt shows. When doubt comes, it shows where our faith is and our faith is not. For those who believe in Christ and follow him, their faith is in him because they doubt in their own ability. They doubt who they are outside of God, their creator. Those who have no need for faith, they doubt in God. And they believe, I'm God enough. I can handle it on my own. My faith is in me. Simple as that. Why do you think Jesus, in the Garden of Eden, God said, don't eat of the one fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why? Because when they ate, that would bring self-awareness to understand the difference from good and wrong. And with self-awareness comes self-importance. And then once there's self-importance, there's self-worship, and it gets us to where we are here today. Think about it. You have faith in anything. If you're going to take a job, it's because you have faith that that job is going to be better than the other jobs that you're applying for, right? If you doubt, what do you do? Well, let's just hope. No, you investigate it, right? Let's look at the salaries. Let's try to peek the kind of people I will be sitting next to. What's my commute like? Because it's important. And then those doubts of the other jobs are saying, I don't think the job's going to be as good as this one. You see, doubt is it's not bad in, it, in itself. It's what you do with that doubt. What does it drive you to? When we doubt Jesus, like Thomas did, are we going to find it important enough to investigate it? Are we just going to stick around? Or are we going to just flee and go our own way and be done with it? It's too important of a topic for us just to, to brush away like most of society does. It, it, and I encourage you this morning, whatever unanswered questions you, like Thomas that, that you have, don't just brush them aside. Don't let them go unanswered. Don't let this doubt that you have turn into this unsettled cynicism. Investigate it for yourself. Take the time. It's the most important decision you can ever make in your life because it reaches into every aspect of your life. And those around you. And for those of you who don't think that you need Jesus, that you're just fine if we just all leave each other alone. All roads lead to the same place. Truth is not relative. Jesus was not relative. He was all about the truth. He said there's not many roads that lead to God. There is one road. In John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That no one, no one, no one comes to the Father but by me. And we now know through his death and his resurrection. Now maybe if he was some quack on the streets, we could dismiss him. But he, Jesus is the most influential person in the history of this world. Whether you believe he was the Son of God or not. His teachings, his life has shaped more kings and kingdoms, cultures and countries than anybody else. Even those who don't follow him cannot deny his influence. Those who follow the religion of Islam in the Quran, it mentions Jesus five times more than its own prophet. Jesus is everywhere. Everywhere. His truth shines in the darkest corners, in the most wrong beliefs, he is there. We have no idea how much Jesus shapes our culture today. There are certain ways that we live as a culture, moral codes that we have, that were set by Jesus and we don't even know it. 
Because our soul, soul is separated. We can't see past our own lives. Because of his influence, you have to deal with what he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but through me. You have to deal with that. You have to make a choice. If he was a lunatic, he was a liar, or he was the Lord. But you can't leave it alone. Your ignoring it does not change truth. It just determines your future. Now, some of you may not ignore him, but you don't believe that he died and rose again. Well, I encourage you, walk in, investigate, find out. This morning on your way out, if you're a visitor this morning, we have the case for Easter. Very short book. Uh, less than 100 pages. I read it in a day. For those of you who know me, that's pretty good. Grab one on your way out. Investigate it. I mean, think about it. <laughs> if nothing else, some of you remember James, the brother of Jesus. He doubted Jesus. It's recorded. He doubted Jesus. And in the end, he ended up being a martyr for Jesus and one of the leaders in the church. And let me put it to you this way. What would your brother have to do to prove to you that he was the son of God? Huh? The one who white boogers on you. The one who stole your choice. The one who always beats you in every game. What would he have to do for you to believe that he was the son of God, that you would be willing to put your life on the line and die for his name? How can you attest for the, the dramatic change in Greek and Jewish beliefs about eternity that were for centuries and they changed and in what terms, relatively speaking, is a drop of the dime? It would be like you having a staunch Republican or staunch Democrat just one night waking up the next day and switching parties. We all know that don't happen. Now, maybe he didn't die. Maybe he never really died. Let me tell you, it's recorded of him being on the cross even outside of scripture, him dying in that way. And if he had spikes in his hands, if he was cut in his side, if he was beat with a whip with glass and metal shards and a crown of thorns, is that the type of person do you think the disciples would have rallied behind it until the death of their teller died for him? Many tortured? So he's laying there, limping. I am the way. Barely able to move with the beating that he took? No, I don't think so. Maybe it was a hoax. I don't know a lot of people that die for a hoax. Maybe they were delusional. Problem is, most delusional people, they withdraw. Christians engaged. Crazy people do not care for other people at their own expense. This is just scratching the surface. Now some of you, maybe you believe, but you just don't want Jesus because of the false expectations. Maybe you were told Jesus was going to be something else in your life other than he was. AC said this best one of our well, sound gentlemen. He said that some people base their relationship with Jesus on their relationships with other individuals. That if other people treat him poorly, that means Jesus treats them poorly. They never take the time that they don't have anything to do with each other. Just because this person in the church was a jerk to me, it doesn't mean that Jesus does not love and care for me. Or we get angry, like I said, when Jesus doesn't make everything perfect in our lives. But that's not what he says in Scripture. He says he'll promise he'll be there when we're going through the rough stuff. One author puts it, for us to have faith in something is to meet our expectations. And the problem is that a lot of us put the wrong expectations on Jesus. And when those expectations are not met, you have one of two choices. Either you walk away angry and upset, or you investigate, where did those expectations come from? But you've got to take the steps to investigate. Don't give up on Jesus. Whatever the reason, one I mentioned or one I have not mentioned, don't give up on Jesus. Do not let doubt be the end of your faith, but let it be the beginning. And I'm not saying that you have to believe overnight, but you should want to believe that this is true. 
Sometimes we go around not wanting to believe it's true. You should want to because it changes everything. It means you're not some science mistake. It means you're not some willless spirit, a biological mutation. It means you were made by the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you were made in the image of God with gifts and purposes to make a difference for all of eternity. Don't give up on Jesus. So I'll tell you right now, he has not given up on you. We read in Jude 22, it talks about having mercy on those who doubt. And look what he did with Thomas. Just like with Thomas, Jesus has room for your doubt. He has room for your doubt. He has patience for your doubt, but he's not going to force you. That's why it's a relationship. You've got to choose to investigate and not walk away. And if you do not walk away, hear me now, and people in this room will testify this. I promise you, he will give you what you need to believe. Not what you want or think you need to believe, but what you actually need to believe. He says, blessed are the people who have not seen and yet believe, Jesus does. You see, often what we think we need to believe in our natural eyes, we think that's what we need for belief. But Jesus, Jesus knew that what we could see with our eyes or hear with our ears, it would be not enough to carry us through the hardships of life because our relationship with him would be attached to this physical being in front of us. He knew that it was only by the Spirit of God inside us that goes with us everywhere we go and in every moment would be strong enough to keep us close to him as we go through the trials of life. And it's all in an effort that one day we will be like Thomas who says, my Lord and my God. It is in my prayer this morning that you would call upon the name of the Lord. That you would today put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Some of you have given up this morning because you think that Jesus has given up on you. You've been gone too long and done too much, but let me tell you right now, if you had did too much, Jesus would still be in the grave. If your sin was that powerful, he wouldn't be risen again, and we wouldn't be celebrating. So you have never gone too much, you never, you've never done too much. I heard it described this way, that our lives are like a very thin wall that we are walking, and there are like three lives, three men walking on that wall. The first man's name is Fact. The second man's name is faith. And the third man's name is feeling. And in life, we're such a narrow, narrow walk that as long as faith keeps his eyes on fact, we're good and we keep moving. But it's in that moment that faith turns around and starts looking at feeling that we start to wobble, we start to fall. And what do we read in Jeremiah? That our heart, that our feelings are so defeatful. So what do we do in those times that we think, Jesus is done with me. There's no way I can come back. We looked at fact. We looked at fact. We looked back in the, the book of Jonah. Remember, we did our Jonah series in Counterfeit Grace. We talked about that even though we ignore God, he never ignores us. We looked at that no matter how in the depths we are, where our sin has taken us, even though we can't find God, he has already found us. We read in Philippians 2 that it is God who's at work in us, at work in us for his good pleasure. The same God that died for you while you're still a sinner does not give up on you now. Believe. Want to believe. Close your eyes with me this morning. Bow your heads. Father, it is my prayer this morning For Jesus to reach into the lives of these people here that have never called upon the name of the Lord. Following Jesus is not just saying a prayer and then walking away until you visit on Easter and Christmas. It is a posture, a change in your life where you believe in Jesus, his death and his resurrection. You repent for not following him and you choose to follow him the rest of your days. 
In Romans, it tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God, that there's nothing that we can do. There's no amount of good. Our good is like filthy rags, but the grateful thing is that Jesus paid the price. There is nothing that we need to do. And I pray this morning, this will be the day that you call upon the name of the Lord, that you will say to him, Father, I believe in you. I believe that you died and you rose again. I believe that you love and created me. I am sorry for my sins that I have not followed you. And I pray from this day forward that I put my faith and my trust in you. And I thank you for salvation of my sins. I pray that you would make that your prayer this morning. It doesn't have to be exact words. Just pour out your heart to God. I, my prayer is for those this morning that felt like they've walked away from God, that you know he's right here waiting for you, that you doubt, touch my hands, touch my side, he says, I have covered all sins. And I pray this morning that you will make a commitment to come back to the Lord. I pray for those of you this morning that are reaching out to people in your lives who doubt Jesus, that you will continue to be patient with them as God is patient with us that you will continue to pray for them and to be the hands of Christ to them until they call upon the name of the Lord. I pray for those of you today, you're still just trying to figure things out. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You're saying, I pray, just send, pray this simple prayer, Lord, help me to know who you are. Give me what I need to believe, Father. thank you for your spirit, Father. We thank you for the power of your good book. I pray as the doubts come this week that we will turn to your word, that the doubts come this week that we will come back to church. When the doubts come this week that we will learn that we need brothers and sisters in a life group around us. Father, that we will investigate, that we will press in when we doubt and not pull away, and it will be for the glory of your name, and that people around us will see it and they will praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.